Um, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 7. Here we go. It says, after the king was settled in his palace and the Lord God had given him rest from all of his enemies around him, he said to Nathan the prophet, here I am living in a house of cedar while the ark of God remains in a tent. Nathan replied to the king, whatever you have in mind, go ahead and do it for the Lord is with you. But that night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan saying, go and tell my servant David, this is what the Lord says. Are you the one to build me a house to dwell in? I have not dwelt in a house from the day I brought the Israelites up out of Egypt to this day. I have been moving from place to place with a tent as my dwelling. Whenever I have moved with all the Israelites, did I ever say to any of their rulers whom I commanded to shepherd my people of Israel, why have you not built me a house of cedar? Let us pray. Father, thank you so much for the opportunity for us to delve into your word and to truly understand what you want us to see and hear today. We want to be inspired. May your Holy Spirit fill this sanctuary. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And all of these years, I have, have I ever asked you to build me a house of cedar. It's really interesting that the sanctuary, as we have come to understand it, Solomon's temple and the one built after it, was never ordered by God. God never instructed his people to build him a temple. It's as if it really didn't matter to him. He says basically, I've been cool hanging out in the tent all of my time with you. Have I ever once complained? It's interesting because David obviously is looking at the other nations and he's wanting to compete a bit, right? He sees Baal and the, and the ornament uh, temples that they had built for that God and all the other gods around them from other uh, nations. And David is like, it's not fair. It's not fair that I should be in a palace. Uh, uh, I, should, I should be celebrated the way that I am and God is just in a tent. It's not fair. It's not fair. But David didn't understand something about God's character and you need to understand this point. I believe it is fundamental when it comes to understanding the character of God. God does not care about gold and silver and diamonds and jewels. None of this is what he gets excited about. God does not need to sit on a throne. God does not need to be elevated the way that we believe that, that he is requiring us to do so. This is man's construct. This is how we celebrate those who rule over us. God comes among us. In fact, when the angels sang glory to God in the highest, guess where he was when, when they sang those songs on a, on a cool Bethlehem night? He was in a manger. Glory to God in the highest. I know I have some of my Vallejo Central family here. I just see them, want to acknowledge them. This is the OG Vallejo. Vallejo Central. But Vallejo Drive, we're up in the house now. We're here. So the Bible tells us that, that God is not the one who is clamoring for this level of praise. This is what we clamor for. This is what we desire. This is why God was very clear with David. I have never asked for this. Never, not once. So why does God give in to this type of adoration? Why does God eventually give in to this? Because there's a significant point that needs to be made. The people of Israel were a nomadic people. They were traveling through the desert. They never felt stable. They were always under attack. And so there was a great need for them to feel a sense of permanence. Now the throne has been established in Jerusalem. And God is wanting to set up his people to have a, 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 a future of peace. And building something that was grounded and stable was important for the people mentally and emotionally. Not spiritually, mentally and emotionally. I say not spiritually because God never needed that in order to connect with Adam and Eve. God never needed a temple in order to connect with Abraham, a friend of God. God never needed this in order to, 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 to speak with Jacob through dreams and wrestle like, you know, like buddies. Uh, God never needed this. Nature was God's sanctuary. In fact, when in Psalm 50, God has to 
keep it real with David. He says, do you think I care about these sacrifices? You think I love the smell? It's a stench in my nostrils. He says, do you think I'm hungry like these other gods and you have to prepare me a P, B, and J? Do you think that if I were hungry, I would ever tell you I own a cattle on a thousand hills? He said, the only thing that I want from you is a thank you. That's what he says. The only thing I want from you is a thank you. I don't need all this other stuff, all the pomp and circumstance. This is what you need, and this is really important. The children of Israel, when they came out of Egypt, were to worship God on the holy mountain. And when they got there, God, of course, had, a, he had an entire show. There was lightning, there was thunder, there was trumpets, you know, there was an earthquake, and God said, do not touch the mountain. But once the ceremony was over, God then beckoned the people to come into the dark cloud with Moses so that he could have an intimate encounter with his people, so he could talk to them the way that he spoke to Moses. It was the people who said, no, Moses, we can't go into that dark cloud. You speak to God, and you tell us what he tells you. This was the first time you truly have a mediator, Moses having to mediate because the people could not stand to be in the presence of God. Moses beckons them, don't be afraid, don't be afraid. He's just testing you, but come into the cloud, have that connection that I have with him. So a lot of what we see in the Old Testament with the sanctuary, a lot of what we see with all of these uh, religious uh, ceremonies is really what the people needed in order to feel close to God. And let me be honest with you right now, most of us need all of this to feel close to God. Most of us need the liturgical, the rituals. We need all of this to feel like we can draw near to God. Some of us won't even feel like that we had an encounter with God unless we have all of these things in the sanctuary. But believe it or not, in the beginning, before sin, God would just come in the cool of the day. He would just roll up on Adam and Eve and just say, what's up? That was it. Adam, Eve, where are you? Are you guys playing hide and seek again? There was no need for most of what we understand as worship. Worship for Adam and Eve was connecting with God. It was about community. So then why this? I'll tell you. The people needed a sense of permanence. The people needed to know that their God was valued and worth something. The people needed to see that, that their God was also special and elevated among the other gods. And so God does something that you must understand happens a lot, especially in the Old Testament. God condescends. He comes down to a level where we can connect and we can relate with him. Now, I know some of you are going to have a little issue with this. No, pastor, the sanctuary, the temple. No, temple, the tabernacle simply means God being among his people, tabernacling with his people. God one with us, right? God with us. That's all it means. But people didn't think they could have that connection with God unless they had the tabernacle. The tabernacle was the sign that God was in the midst of his people. But Jesus tells us where two or three are gathered in my name, I am where? In the midst. Jesus broke down the walls. He tore the curtain. He made God so accessible, so accessible, Brother Super, that he would say, we are friends. No longer do I call you servants in John 15, but I have called you friends. For everything my Father has made known to me, I have made known to you. The people of God needed to know there was permanence. So God said, listen, I am permanently among you. You will not have to be on the run anymore. You will not have to be a nomadic people. You can be settled. But there's a problem. David wants to do this, but God is not for David doing this. In verse 20, in ver chapter 22, 1 Chronicles, you have your Bibles, let's go there. 1 Chronicles chapter 22. 1 Chronicles chapter 22. God tells David that he cannot build him a temple. And David explains to his son, Solomon, why he is not allowed. I want us to read this real quickly. 1 Chronicles 22, starting with verse 6. It's on the screen there. It says, then he called his son Solomon and charged him to build a house for the Lord, the God of Israel. David said to Solomon, my son, I had it in my heart to do what? 
to build a house for the name of the Lord my God. But this word of the Lord came to me, you have shed much blood and have fought many wars. You are not to build a house for my name. Ouch. Can I just say that real quick? Ouch. The man after God's own heart is not worthy enough to build him a house because you have shed much blood on earth in my sight, but you will have a son and he will be a man of what? Peace and rest. You will have a son and he will be a man of peace and he'll be a man of rest and I will give him rest from all his enemies on every side. His name will be Solomon and I will grant Israel peace and quiet during his reign. He is the one who will build the house for my name. He will be my son and I will be his father. And then later on in that, in that passage, David tells Solomon, he says, be careful to keep the law of God. Be careful to follow his instructions. Be courageous, my son. Do not be discouraged. God is with you. But I want to just have a theology 101 moment here. Can we do that? Theology 101. You know how we do this every now and then in our message. God is not a God of war. David was synonymous with war. He was, I mean, he was the most popular warrior of his generation. Remember, he beat the champion from Gath. The, the song was clear. David is, Saul has killed his thousands, but David his ten thousands. But God is not a God of war. Just because there's war in the Bible, don't assume God is for it. God is a God of peace. Jesus is the prince of peace and not the prince of war. When Jesus comes to this earth as the Prince of Peace, it is a clear picture of who God is. According to Hebrews chapter 1, Jesus is the perfect radiance, the perfect reflection of who God is. In other words, if some of the texts in the Old Testament get a little confusing, why did God order this? Why did God say this? Why did God seemingly uh, tell the people, the children of Israel, to do this? Look no further than Jesus Christ. He is the perfect unfiltered picture of God. He is a perfect reflection of the character of God. God is a God of peace, not a God of war. Yes, there is war in the Bible, but it is not a reflection of God. It's a reflection of sin. That there is war in the Bible is not a reflection of who God is. It's a reflection of how sin is. Are you understanding that? Pastor, but there was war in heaven. There was war in heaven because someone chose to sin. And God wasn't fighting Satan. Satan was fighting God. Oh, but pastor, you know, you have to understand God has to pull out the sword and he has to swing. There were no lightsabers in the war in heaven. It was a war of words. A war of ideologies. A war of character. That's what was going on, not a, not, a, not a wrestling match in heaven. But pastor, Revelation says there's a sword that, that Jesus wields. It comes out of his mouth. Come on, Bible scholars. The sword comes out of his mouth. He's not wielding it with his hand. It comes out of his mouth. It is symbolic of the gospel of the kingdom coming out of Jesus' mouth. When Jesus decided to conquer a uh, 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 sin and establish his kingdom on earth, he never once picked up a sword. Not once did he order his angels to come down and fight for him. We see that in the Gospels. No, Jesus conquers through sacrifice. Oh, that's a good word. Jesus doesn't conquer with the, with the instruments that we use. God conquers sin not by being stronger than sin. God conquers sin through sacrifice. This is how Jesus wins the battle. Here's the problem. Seeing God as a warrior, seeing God as the one who fights, seeing God as the one who, of, of bloodshed gives us excuse to also shed blood. How many holy wars have been fought in the name of the Lord? Hello? Embarrassing. How many battles have been waged in the name of Jesus Christ? Can I make it a little more personal? How many wars do we fight in this church in the name of Christ? How many times have we fought with one another? You know how much blood has been spilt in this church? Oh, I know. I've only been here a couple months, but I've heard. 
I've had some people try to discourage me from coming to this church. They said, ah, pastor, they got some stuff going on there. I'm like, good. I told one of our, our, our conference leaders, I said, this kind of stuff gets me excited. Because I believe that many of us fight because many of us fight. We fight the way that we fight because we don't understand God and how he works. We are not going to win battles even within the church because we are stronger than one another or because we have more influence or because we have more money or because we have, more, uh, we have, we have a longer lineage here in the church. It's not, we are going to win and we are going to succeed because we are going to be experts at sacrifice. We're going to learn how to give in to another. We talked a little bit about that last week. Oh, is this what you need, brother? Is this what you need, sister? All right, well, you'll get your song for five minutes, and we get our song for seven minutes. That's a good exchange. God is not a God of war. He's a God of peace, and we need to experience that in our church. In order for us to move forward and to be healthy, we must follow the Prince of Peace. Amen? Now, here's the problem. David is disqualified from building a temple. Now, you're probably saying, but Pastor, you called us out. You said we were fighting each other, and there was spilt blood. So we disqualified? Well, look what happens in 1 Chronicles 28. 1 Chronicles 28, verses 11 and 12, it says, Then David gave his son Solomon the plans for the temple, its buildings, its storerooms, its upper parts, its inner rooms, the place of atonement. He gave him plans of all that the Spirit had put in his mind. All that the Spirit had done what? Put in his mind for the courts of the temple of the Lord and all the surrounding rooms for the treasuries of the temple of God and for the treasuries of the dedicated things. The Bible tells us that David reasons that his son is too inexperienced, too immature to take on a project of this magnitude. So David decides he is going to put the blueprints together. David is the one who orders all the parts on Amazon and eBay. David is the one who organizes the entire workforce. By the time Solomon is able to take over and be the king, all he has to do is cut the ribbon. That's it. David does absolutely everything that the Spirit of God had put in him. And this is a powerful lesson for us to learn. Some of us, some of us have hurt ourselves with the blood that has been spilled. Some of us have, our, our hands are a little dirty. Some of us have played a little bit dirty, right? Let's be honest. But this never disqualifies us from being of use in God's service. God did not want to be associated with war. God did not want David to build it because it needed to be very clear that God's presence, his temple, and all the things associated with it are not associated with war, right? God is a prince of peace. This is really clear. Needs to be, means to be certain among all the people of God. I am not a God of war. This is a result and of your own backwards thinking and sin and all your guys' confusion and, 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 your, and your human nature. But as far as my nature is concerned and my character, I am a God of love. I am a God of peace. I am a God of joy. This is, this is the fruits of the Holy Spirit. I am a God of everything that is good. Nothing evil can come from me. I am a God of truth. But that did not mean that David could not contribute in his own way. And this is a part that I think is really important in our church. There are some of us that even though the war, the, the personal war is within the church, have discouraged them and have hurt them, and some have kept their distance because of it, it is a blessing to see that people still give in their own way. David says, I might not be able to lay any brick for this temple, but I'm going to do everything that I can to support this project. I want to think, I want to take time to thank a lot of members who may not even show up on Sabbath morning, but they still tune in. They still contribute in their own way. Watch what happens here. Yet you support any way that you can. First Chronicles 29. First Chronicles 29. I just want to read just a couple of verses, 3, 14, 16, and 17. It says in First Chronicles 29, besides in my devotion to the temple of my God, I now give my what? personal treasures of gold and silver for the temple of my God over and above everything I have provided for this holy temple. Let's skip down verse 14. But who am I and who are my people that we should be able to give as generously as this? Everything comes from who? You, Lord. Everything comes from you. 
He, I love, the, I love the, the, the way that he paints this beautiful picture. Everything comes from your hand. Lord, your God, Lord, our God, all his abundance that we have provided for the building, you, a temple for the, your holy name, comes from your hand, and all of it belongs to you. I know, my God, that you test the heart and are pleased with integrity. All things I have given willingly and with honest intent, and now I have seen with joy how willing your people who are here have given to you. Oh, that's a good word. Lord, you've examined our heart. You know that we are giving from a good place. You know that we are giving with integrity. You know what our intent is. We are giving from a place of abundance. But Lord, everything that we give you, this is what David says, and I want you to get this point. Everything that we give you, Lord, is already yours. The only reason why we're able to give you anything is because of what you have given us. Is that a good word? Watch this. Which means... When we give, we never give with the intent to control. Do I need to say that again? That means that when we contribute, either with our time, with our finances, with the spiritual gifts that God gives us, we never use that in order to control. This is really important. As a pastor, I cannot abuse my influence in this church. This pulpit is never a place for me to exercise my own personal agenda, bring up stuff that went down and bored that I'm not pleased about. That is an abuse of power and the gifts that God has given me. That means even with you, however long you've been in ministry in this church, however much money that you've contributed to this church, it is never to be used as a way of controlling things and getting your way. Why? Because what you were given that you gave to the church wasn't yours to begin with. Somebody say amen. It was the Lord's all along. The only reason why you had it is because God gifted it to you. No, pastor, I worked hard for this. Yes, you did. But you were at the right place at the right time with the gifts that God had given you. And when you acknowledge the source, God gives more. The problem is some of us get these gifts and it goes to our head and we become a little bit Luciferian. And God doesn't want any more Lucifers in the universe. Hello? He already has one. He's good with that. So we must acknowledge where it comes from, these gifts that God blesses us with. It is for the purpose of us doing something special together. And David acknowledges the generosity. He says, I've given from my own palace. I've given from my own Bank of America account. I have given from my own personal treasury, and I'm now seeing how everyone else around. I am so happy to announce that, man, our finance committee, our board, I mean, just they got together a, a, a couple weeks ago, and we are set, we are set to, 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 to remodel those restrooms. <laughs> We're set. It's going to be good. And you should have seen the enthusiasm on this board. And I was told, Pastor, we've tried to do this like four times. It doesn't work. Well, it's working now. I have been sensing a harmony within this church that I am so excited about. People with joy, with, with great anticipation, looking forward to the future. And this is the beautiful part about it. What David was investing in, he was never going to enjoy. What David was investing in, he would never enjoy, but it wasn't about David. It was about God and his people. So he was okay that his legacy would be, I got the blueprints together. I, I got an account on Amazon. I got all the materials coming this way. David was fine taking a back seat. Praise God for those that can be in the back seat and still contribute. They don't have to be up front. They don't have to have their name in lights. Praise God. This church exists for the generosity of its members. You can say amen to that. The generosity, because of the generosity of members, we have a choir, we have lights on, we, know, we have people that are working behind the scenes, and there's some people that it doesn't take money to get things done. There are people that are working night and day. Can I just give it up for Mavis upstairs, Mavis and Gideon? You have no idea how much work they put in. No, seriously. No, no, no. I got to say this real quick. You have no idea how much Mavis puts into this. I started talking to Mavis weeks before I came to this church. I talked to her more than I talked to anyone else, even the pastoral staff. Mavis is like a pastor herself. The work that she puts in never asks for anything. This is how stuff gets done. You have no idea what happens behind the scenes in order for us to have a worship like we have here. 
All right, we're closing right now. But all of this, family, all of this is for a purpose. The reason why we invest in the sanctuary, the reason why we invest in a temple, the reason why we do this is because, yes, we do want permanence in the city of Glendale. We want an establishment. We want people to know that we're here. We want people to, to see this building and know what it stands for and what it represents. We want people to say, yes, this is the place where they help me have clean clothes, laundry love. This is the place where I can come and spend a week and not on the streets and I can learn and, 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 and gain some skills and education and better my family. This place must exist exist not so we can look good so that God can look good and he can still do what he's always wanted to do in the communities have presence we have to get to a point family where the sanctuary the temple itself is not the object of our adoration the sanctuary itself is not the object of our worship but is the object for worship it is not the object in which we are willing to fight one another and say, my grandfather, he laid the... Stop it. It's too much self. This is not a building as beautiful as it is. And I've been to a lot of Adventist churches. This is, honestly, this is my favorite. This is my favorite sanctuary of all the Adventist churches I've ever visited abroad in this country. All right, I, I'm, I'm not just saying that. I've always felt that way. I love the way it's designed. But I will not worship this building. This building exists not to be worshipped. This building exists for worship in the community, for the community to come together. It is here to facilitate something. It is not the object of our worship. It is the object in which we can worship our God. And this is what's most important. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I love this. Jesus comes to this earth and he establishes something, a whole new mindset. Paul says it in 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple, and that God's spirit dwells in your minds. If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person. For God's temple is what? Sacred, and you together are that temple. Let me say this again. God's temple is sacred, and he says, and you alone, you on your own, you as an individual, what does he say? You together are that temple. You know when we are sacred? We're sacred when we're together. We are sacred when we are together. We are holy when we are together. That's what makes us sacred, when we are together. He tells the woman at the well, my very first sermon here, he told the woman at the well, the day is coming and has now come when you will worship God neither on this mountain or in Jerusalem, but you will worship him in spirit and in truth. In John 7, he continues. In John 7, he continues. He says, uh, talking to the people, that, that those who are thirsty come and water. He will give them, right, to quench their thirst, like he told the woman in John 4. And John says, the, John says in chapter 7 that the water that Jesus is speaking of is the Holy Spirit that would be poured out when he was glorified. The Holy Spirit would be poured out. The place where God's Spirit dwelled, his Shekinah glory, could only reside in the most holy place in the temple. But Jesus, after his death and ascension and glorification, was able to rent that, 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 that curtain in two that was separating the most holy from the rest of the compartments. And, and really what Jesus was saying to the entire world, my spirit will be unleashed on all flesh. And we would finally understand this one truth, and this is what I'm going to close on, this one truth, and that is simply this. This sanctuary, this church, this building is to facilitate the real building, the real sanctuary, the real temple, and it's you. This place is holy because you're holy. This place is set apart because God set you apart. We come together in this house so that we can build a house for the city of Glendale. Oh, not a house with walls. But we can establish the kingdom of God here on earth. Christ said the kingdom of God is now here among you and we are his hands and his feet. So no matter where we find ourselves, no matter where we are, that we realize the presence of God is with us and we are stronger together. 
A heart of a champion is a heart that recognizes it's a part of the sanctuary where God's spirit dwells, where he brings his people together. And we become that temple so God can tabernacle with the city of Glendale. So God can tabernacle with the rest of the world. I want whatever happens in this sanctuary to build a greater sanctuary. Not with human hands. Family, do you want to be a part of that temple? Pastor, I have blood on my hands. I know, I know. That email was pretty ugly. It's kind of hard to walk that one back. What you said behind that person's back, oh, they may forgive you. They may not be able to forget, though. But you know what? Let's keep contributing. Let's find other ways. Let's figure it out. Because we're building something here. And it's going to be great. It's going to be grand. It's going to be like that rock in Daniel chapter 2 that begins to grow and grow until it fills the whole world. When he tells David, I will build my church upon this rock and not even the gates of hell will be able to prevail against it. Do you want to be a part of that temple family? Are you ready to transform the world? Starting with the transformation in here first. If that's where you are, pray with me. Father God, thank you so much. You have built us a sanctuary. You are building us a sanctuary. Jesus, we thank you for being that example of a temple, a way in which you tabernacled with people. We want to also tabernacle. We want to be princes and princesses of peace. Even if it means we don't get our own way, through sacrifice, may we transform the world the way that you do. So, Father, in that earthly tabernacle, there were lots of sacrifices of animals and lots of rituals. But may our new ritual be the ritual of love. May it not be the sacrifice of animals, but be the sacrifice of our ego. So that your will can be done on earth as it is in heaven. Tabernacle with us. Teach us, Lord, in your name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Jonathan, for that message that the temple of God is not of rock or stone, but it is totally within each of our hearts. Since the time that Jesus walked here on earth, across the centuries, across the miles, a creed was written early in the Christian history, which is called the Credo of the Christian, and I'm going to ask you to repeat it with me. I think they've put it up there so that we can read it together. It's probably something we should read more often that, than we do and share it. It begins with, I believe in God, the Father Almighty. Again, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born to the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, one Christian church, the communion of the followers of Christ, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. The choir will be singing the credo for you, written by 
the husband of our conductor some years ago, and it will be done in Latin, but now you know the words.
said to Michal, it was before the Lord who chose me rather than your father. Now that was, that was unnecessary, David. Who chose me over your father, over anyone from his house when he appointed me ruler over the Lord's people Israel. I will celebrate before the Lord. I will become even more what? Undignified. Ooh, Pastor Irvin, that's, that's, a, that's, not a, that's a bad word for, for, for Elder Irvin. He, he, he wants things to be dignified in the church. That was my first, my first Sabbath. He says, Pastor dig, Dignified. That was his thing. We must be dignified. I said, okay, okay. Undignified, David says. Undignified, undignified. I'll be even more undignified than this. And I will be humiliated in my own eyes. But by these slave girls you spoke of, I will be held in honor. Let us pray. Father, we thank you so much for trusting us in this space of worship. As we open up your word, teach us today what you would have us know. Open our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Wow, I will become even more undignified. I grew up in an era where holiness in the sanctuary was a thing. I know times have changed. Back in the day, I couldn't even sit on the steps for children's story. My mother instructed us not to do it because it was, it was leading to holy ground. The first time I preached in a church, I was 15 years old, and I remember being on the rostrum thinking to myself, can I actually sit up here? We were taught that it was holy. If we touched the stage, we would get pow-pow. We were not allowed to run in church. Children, you have it well. Some of y'all like running like it's a track meet to get down to children's story. If we ran, ooh, we would get it. Twice in church and then when we got home. It's a sacred place. It was holy. And the church that I grew up in San Bernardino, the choir would sing a special song as the pastors entered in. The pastors didn't show up at the beginning. They weren't in the, they weren't in the sanctuary with the rest of the church for announcements and opening hymn and things like that. They came in at a special time and the choir would sing, let all mortal flesh keep silent. Oh, I love that song. Alicia Richards on the organ and she'd play that, that low note and you just knew that the Holy Spirit was, was being ushered into the sanctuary and then we would sing the doxology. Remember those days? Remember the doxology? Some of your kids are like, what? Dox what? Oh, yeah, man, it was serious business. The ministers would come in with the elders and then they would kneel and we knew God was there. We took worship serious. Some of you are like, that's right, pastor. We need to go back to those days. Here was the problem, though. A lot of us growing up didn't like church. Be honest with you. We didn't like church. It was unlike anything else we experienced in our week, which is what the point is for most people. They want the service to be holy and feel special. The holiness of our worship experience is important to, to many. And holy simply means to set apart, just means to make special, that it is different. And it should be different. I think that whatever we do here should feel set apart from anything that we do during the week. But sometimes it was set so far apart from anything that we did during the week that it made God very impersonal. So I, I want you to understand that there's a reason why people approach holiness the way that they do. And I think there's something unusual about the way that David approaches it in this story. Now, before we go any further, I want to go back just a little bit earlier in chapter 6. Because earlier in chapter 6, there's something that's going on that goes very, very wrong. And there's a reason why David changes it up the next time he comes into the city with the ark. Now, the Ark of uh, the Covenant had not been in Jerusalem at all. And it was important for David to now have the Ark of the Covenant in Jerusalem because it was established now for certain that this would be the seat of power among all of God's people. This is where they would have the tabernacle. This is where the Ark belonged. And in 2 Samuel, let's go back up to the beginning here. 2 Samuel chapter 6, starting with verse 3. David again brought together all the able young men of Israel, 30,000 
they set the ark of God on a new cart and brought it from the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. Now, let me just stop here real quick. Anybody know what went wrong already? Anybody have an idea what went wrong? Yes. They, that's right. Ugh. This man deserves something as a reward here. They put it on a cart instead of on poles and having the priest carry it. The Levites carrying it. So this was critical. David put it on a cart the same way the Philistines did. Now, the Philistines did not have the church manual, so that can be understood. But David and his peeps had the church manual, and they disregarded the sacredness of the Ark of the Covenant. Now, you need to understand how and why the Ark of the Covenant was considered sacred. It was the mercy seat. It was the very throne of God. God sat there in between the two covering cherubs. This Ark of the Covenant had the Ten Commandments in it, Aaron's rod in it, and it was, in, it was, to, it was to be placed in the most holy place in the tabernacle and later on in the temple. No one could just roll up on the Ark of the Covenant. You had to be set apart, sanctified, purified. Not just any priest could roll up into the most holy place. And here is David, 30,000 people running around, celebrating, singing songs, and he just has it on a cart in a wheelbarrow. And as they're going along, the Bible says that Uzzah and Ahio, sons of Abinadab, were guiding the new cart with the ark of God on it. And Ahio was walking in front of it. David and all Israel were celebrating with all their what? Their might before the Lord. With all of these beautiful instruments. And just so you know, the timbrels are in there along with the cymbals. I know some of you had a little reaction when Pathfinders came in with all them drums. Some of you were loving it, saying, that's what I'm talking about. And some of you were like, this is not appropriate. Not in the house of God. But they were rocking with some timbrels and some cymbals. That was percussion instruments. Those were drums. And they're walking and they're celebrating with all of their might. Have you ever seen anybody worship with all of their might? I know not in the Seventh-day Adventist church. <laughs> we will celebrate with all of our intellect, but not with all of our might. But hear me, though. It's a cultural thing. It's a cultural thing. So I'm not, I'm not in any way trying to be disparaging because even my old school part of me the drums were going, and I was like, wow, those, those are a little loud. <laughs> Listen, I was raised in a certain type of church. I'm, I'm telling you, it was a black church. It was a traditional church, though. Right? So when, when they finally introduced drums into that church, the pastor who brought them in <laughs> let them sit in the corner for an entire year before anyone ever touched them. He was conditioning us. So when they were finally played, we were like, yeah, it's about time. <laughs> Wanted us to get used to the visual of it, right? So I understand this. I understand this. So they're, I mean, they're worshiping with all their might, and they have a new cart. They purchased a new cart on Amazon. They felt like that was the way to show their respect for the Ark of the Covenant. And listen, no matter how good your intentions are, if you don't do things the way God has prescribed for you to do them, it ain't good. Do I need to say that again? No matter how good your intentions are, or if you're not doing things the way God has prescribed you to do them, it ain't good. I know that's, not, that's bad grammar, but it ain't good. And so as they're going along, the Bible says that Uzzah reaches out to steady the ark of God. All right, as we continue on, Uzzah reached out and took hold of the ark of God. Now this is, this is not him just simply... Um, <laughs> him catching it before it fell, he took hold of it to keep it balanced because the, the ox uh, stumbled. Let's, let's continue to read here. Because the oxen stumbled, the Lord's anger burned against Uzzah because of his irreverent act. Therefore, God struck him down and he died there beside the ark of God. Now, I know this sounds really harsh, right? 
It was an irreverent act on the part of Uzzah. That is, that is the, uh, that could be considered the opinion of the author, but the fact that he died immediately suggests that, that it was probably an accurate description of his act of irreverence. In other words, as the ox stumbled, he probably said, oh, the ark probably is not as steady as it needs to be. Why don't I grab a hold of it and help guide it as we, as we go through this terrain and we're worshiping? I'm not going to judge his intentions because I don't know Uzzah's heart. And I don't believe because he died here. This is a theological moment, theological 101, theology 101 here. Just because someone dies on earth in the present day doesn't mean that they have been judged for eternity. Just because Achan died because of his sin back in the book of Joshua doesn't mean that he, is, that he will no longer have uh, access to the, to the throne of God. Just because someone dies because of a sin they committed on this side of eternity does not mean that Christ cannot forgive that sin. So just because Uzzah died, don't pass judgment on his eternal soul that this is for, forever and ever. God will never, ever love. Stop it. Stop it. There's something going on here. There's a lesson that we have to learn. The people at this time had been cut off from the law, had been cut off from the traditions, had been cut off the way that God, again, had prescribed them to worship and to handle holy things. When Uzzah reached out and held, it, held on to it, he clearly has no idea what's about to happen or he would have never reached out. And in this moment, what happens, watch what David's response is. He reaches out, he grabs a hold of it, his irreverent act, and David was angry because the Lord's wrath had broken out against Uzzah, and to this day, the place is called Perez Uzzah. This was a this was an awful situation. The worship experience stops immediately. Everyone stops singing. David is angry with God, and they leave the ark in somebody's garage and go back home. David's like, I'm never worshiping again. I cannot believe the sound system did not work out well, and then there was something wrong with the PowerPoint, and that didn't make it. I'm just, I'm so frustrated. God, what is going on here? I can't believe you got so angry. He just touched the ark. It's just your throne. What's the big deal? Is it a big deal, family? Most of us, don't see it as a big deal because we have lost connection with what is holy. Sacredness doesn't mean a lot to us today. The Sabbath is holy. What does that mean to you? Most of you will watch television on the Sabbath, go out to restaurants on the Sabbath, iron your clothes on the Sabbath, wash your clothes on the Sabbath, all these things. Now you look at me like, Pastor, I did not know you were that old school. What's happening? I'm just telling you, we do things differently, don't we? Do you remember back in the day when hometown buffet was like the Avenus hangout spot after church? No, no, no. You know. And remember how we would buy tickets on Friday so that we could go there and eat on Sabbath? Remember those days? As if that made it so much better. Well, I purchased this on Friday before sundown. Yes, somebody is serving me here, but still, it's different. It's not my manservant or my maidservant. Right, it's so, but times have changed. Now we don't even care at all. We up in that Olive Garden. That's, that's the new Avenue's joint. <laughs> it's Olive Garden. Hey, listen, don't mess with OG. Don't mess with OG. But times have changed. We have lost, I remember my grandparents would make us start keeping the Sabbath as the sun began its descent on Friday. You want to know why? They wanted us to protect the edges of the Sabbath. Protect the edges of the Sabbath. But that's the way we did it. Let me tell you why I think this is an issue in our church. Because things have lost their sacredness and they are no longer holy, they are no longer special. Family, we must feel the specialness that God wants us to experience on this day, in this sanctuary, in these moments, as we study the word, as we are in the presence of God. Yes, Uzzah died because of his irreverent act, but let me tell you this, watch what happens. Because of that irreverent act, 
all of Israel was like, yo, the presence of God is real. It's real. It's real. Now, again, I don't believe his act cuts him off from eternal life. I, that, that, that's between him and the Lord. But I do believe in and. and I do believe it was important for a message to be sent to Israel as God was establishing something new in Jerusalem that would be different from the reign of Saul. So David goes back in frustration. I can't believe, God, you're just an angry and mean God, and you're this. And God is not an angry and mean God. God was establishing something because through the order for them following the word of God, it would prevent them from apostatizing. It would prevent them from following other nations. It would prevent them from getting into quarrels with other nations. God was saying, listen, I know this is going to look like I'm being really tough right now, but I have to give you this time out. I have to discipline you in this way because I love you, and I'm wanting to protect protect you from future potential problems. Anytime you see God flex in the Old Testament or even in the New Testament, it is never because he is so upset he can't control himself. God's anger is always laced with mercy and grace. It is always doused in love. There is never a time that God does anything, even in his wrath, that is not the most loving response for the situation. And maybe one day we will see Uzzah in heaven, and Uzzah won't want to touch anything at the table. And we're like, Uzzah, it's cool, bro. It's cool. You can touch. Nah, 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 man. These utensils are holy, man. I ain't know. You can touch. There was just a point that needed to be made, so you fell asleep early, but it's all good. Jesus also redeemed you. Somebody say amen on that. So, so, so this was really important. So David doesn't want to have anything to do with it. And so, so now he understands things are sacred. Now watch this. His belief is, I am not worthy. I am not good enough. I cannot be in the presence of God. So I just want it to stay far away from me. And this is what a lot of folk do. When I talk about holiness, now you're all starting to start thinking, oh, now I can't do this on the Sabbath. Listen, listen, that is not the point I'm trying to make. I just want you to see the Sabbath as something special in all of the week. That's it. I want to be special. But watch this, watch this. He gets to the point where many of us get to, it's too difficult, too tough, too many rules. Can't do it. Forget it. I'm not even going to show up at church because I'm a sinner. I made this mistake. I'm not even sure if I believe this. I'm not going to be near it at all. David leaves it in the garage of Obed. He's like, I don't want any part of it until he finds out how God is blessing my man. For three months, it's in Obed's garage, and God is blessing his household. And David keeps... He's, you know, he follows him on, 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 on IG, and so he's following him, and he keeps seeing all these stories of how much more money he has, how his crops have been blessed, and how his household is increasing, how his kids graduated, all this kind of stuff. So now David's like, oh, okay, okay, my bad. I thought that if you were in the presence of God, he was so fearsome, so holy, that you might get destroyed if you looked the wrong way. That is a misconception of holiness. God's holiness is about blessing and setting us apart. God's specialness and uniqueness is about how he makes us special and unique. We talk about this way back in the day, this language of being a peculiar people. Some of us were abused with that word, peculiar. You're not peculiar enough. But being peculiar simply means being special. It simply means that God is honoring you and setting you apart, that when you walk and you talk, somebody can step back and say, yo, she different. <laughs> she different. He's different. There's something unique and special and peculiar about this person. So the peculiarity of God and everything that he, he was giving to his people, Obed is being blessed by, and David says, I now want in on this. So David then retrieves it and says, I want it back. If being in the presence of God doesn't mean you die, if being in the presence of God means you feel loved, if being in the presence of God means that you're going to be blessed, I want it back. And now this time they do it a little bit differently. They get the Poles, they get the priests, they get the Levites. Everybody now is following the word. Come on now. Everybody now is following the word because it's serious, it's real. See, this is the great thing. When you take the word of God serious, it means you get to take his promises serious. It means you get to take his grace serious. It means you get to take his love serious. The best part of taking the word of God serious means you get to take the blessing serious as well. 
That means you can take the word of God like my grandma used to always say. She says, when the Lord tries to be silent with me, I grab my Bible and I back him in a corner and said, you sit it right here. And before I was born, this was written. So you better do what I say. See, my grandma could talk to him like that because she was his friend. She knew him. You get to take everything serious. If you take the things that God prescribes us to do, when he tells us to love our enemies, when he tells us to turn the other cheek, when he tells us to do good to those who have harmed us, when he tells us to honor our parents and for our parents not to provoke children unto anger, when we listen to all these principles and we apply them to our life, when we take these things serious, the law of God serious, we get blessed by it. Watch this, watch this, watch this. See, I don't approach the Sabbath like law. Most people do because I realize some people are servants still with God. I'm on a friendship level with him. I look at the Sabbath as a blessing, not as a curse, not as this requirement. This is like you telling your boss, it is so messed up, you give me the weekend off. God invented the weekend. T-G-I-F, that's God. Thank God it's Friday. That came from the Sabbath. Hello? God is the one that invented the weekend. And, and, and when people were so stubborn thinking that they would lose out on money and lose out on time, if they didn't take that, if, if, if they weren't working on the seventh day, God says, why do I have to force people to rest? Listen, <laughs> you must rest. Your animals must rest. It's a good thing. You will have more in the six days that you're working than if you were to work seven days. Close your gates. Stop buying. Stop selling. Rest. Can I show you a little bit of advantage of the, of the rest part? Listen, I know it's going to sound old school. That's all right. I only have like one or two of these a year. All right, so watch this. My grandma used to fix the meals on Friday. So when we came back from church, guess what was ready? Food. <laughs> Every time we came back from church, I was so grateful my grandmother kept the Sabbath in that way because it meant we got our food on time. Now, I love my mom. My mom is the best mother. Look, I'm sorry. It's Mother's Day every single day for me. I love my mom. I know she's resting in Christ right now. I love my mom. My mom didn't approach the Sabbath quite like that. So when we got back from church, and again, I grew up in a black church, so we got back at 3. Listen, I love the Lord, but nobody need to be at church until 3 o'clock in the afternoon. I'm sorry. No worship is that good. But, but when we would get back at 3, because she had to talk to everybody in the church, we, from, we were moving from our pew to the car, it would take two hours. No joke. By the time we got home, mom started cooking the meal. We would take a nap and wake up. It was like 4 or 5 o'clock, and we were eating Sabbath lunch. I looked, I looked at work a whole different way. I was like, why didn't we just do all this work beforehand so that on Sabbath we could just eat, right? And I look at that everything. There's certain things I don't, I don't like ironing clothes. I'm going to iron them before because I don't want to iron them on the Sabbath. Anything that I can do beforehand so that the day can just be special and chill and relaxed and fun, that's what I'm going to do. That is my rule. That, that, that is the rubric that I use. Anything that I can get done before so I can enjoy this day more, I'm going to do it. And God's like, duh. That's what I was talking about, bro. Sabbath should be blessed, should be wonderful. So this is what's going on. So David now comes back to this place, and he's worshiping, and he's worshiping now with all his might. This time, they're coming back with the Ark of the Covenant, doing it the right way, and they are celebrating. Now, some people don't like this visual of David dancing, and some people try to say it was a reverent, holy dance. Listen, my man danced until his clothes came off. There was nothing slow or meditative about the dance. When the Bible says he danced with all his might, they're trying to give us a description. My man was dancing. And there's a reason why Michal was upset. Because it looked for, to her ridiculous. You're a king. And you're just prancing around? And she comes hard at him. You know, you saw the passive aggressive stuff. Oh, I bet the slave girls loved what you were showing today. Now listen, I would love to show you a video of what it looked like. There's a couple of movies out there. One in particular shows him 
dancing half naked, and I said, there's no way I would show this at Vallejo Drive. No, they, would, they would talk to the conference before I finished my prayer. That's how uncomfortable it is. But watch this, watch this, watch this. This is what David did, and he did it before the Lord, and of, of course the author tries to make it <laughs> that, that Michal was cursed, her womb was cursed because she came at David the way that she did. No. David and Michal had been married for like over a decade, almost probably 20 years by this point, and she had never had kids. So God wasn't cursing her womb because she said, oh, being passive aggressive, right? But I want you to understand this. They, the author wanted us to realize that whatever David did was holy and sacred, even though for our eyes, our ears, we would not think so. This is when you have to understand something about worship. As much as I've talked about holiness and sacredness and things being set apart, some of this stuff is just cultural. Look at Nehemiah chapter 8. Look at Nehemiah chapter 8 real quick. It's a, it's a Sabbath worship. You want to see how they got down on Sabbath? It's a Sabbath worship experience. Nehemiah chapter 8. Nehemiah chapter 8. We're going to skip over the Psalm 1 for right now. Nehemiah chapter 8, starting with verse 3. Don't be too dependent on the screens here. Have your own Bibles. Nehemiah chapter 8, starting with verse 3, says uh, that he read it aloud, talking about the law. He read it aloud from daybreak until noon. From daybreak until when? Noon. They got up to worship on Sabbath from daybreak until when? Yeah, you ain't ready for that. Y'all think you got a relationship with God. Ain't nobody willing to get down like that. From daybreak, from the time the sun rose all the way till noon, they were there worshiping. The Bible calls the Sabbath day a day of holy convocation, Leviticus 23, a special gathering of God's people coming together. And it says, until noon, as he faced the square before the water gate in the presence of the men, women, and others who could understand. This is really important, those who could understand. This is why I think it's very important that we don't have children sitting through our worship experience trying to make them adults when they are two and three and four. If they cannot understand, that it is not a blessing for them. One of these days, I don't know when it's going to happen, but one of these days, we're going to have a children's church that your children are so excited about, they will be dragging you out of bed on Sabbath morning because worship for them should also be special. I know you're trying to train them to sit in pews, but they're three, four, five. Let them be kids while they're kids. Church should be fun for them. Being around children who believe in the same God they believe in should be an enjoyment for them. And that is why it's very clear here in Nehemiah chapter 8, for those who could understand. So not the little ones. And all the people listened attentively to the book of the law. Ezra, the teacher of the law, stood on a high wooden platform built for the occasion. That sound like anything we're doing right now? This is wood right here. It looks like stone, but it's wood. A platform so everyone could see him teach. Let's continue down to verse 8. All the people could see him because he was standing above them. And as he opened it, the law, the people all stood up. Ezra praised the Lord, the great God, and all the people lifted their hands and responded, amen, amen. See, y'all thought that just happened in black churches. The scripture was read, the law was read, and everyone stood to their feet. Have you seen churches that do that? When the scripture is read, they all stand to their feet. This is where they get it from. Stood to their feet as the scripture was being read. What they start doing? They started raising their hands, Doug. Raise, how dare you raise your hands up here? Raising their hands. Worshiping and shouting what? Amen, amen. You didn't even know that was in the Bible. You thought, you, you thought it was just a cultural thing. Amen. They then bow down and worship the Lord with their faces to the ground. I've never seen one Adventist worship with their face to the ground. Not once in corporate worship have we been laid prostrate with our faces to the ground. We would never do that. They bowed down and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. They read the book of the law of God, making it clear, making it clear. This is what preachers are supposed to do. We're supposed to use language everyone can grasp, they can connect with it making it clear and giving the meaning so that the people understood what was being read. Then Nehemiah, the governor, Ezra, the priest, and the teacher of the law, and the Levites who were instructing the people said to them all, this, is, this day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep, for all the people had been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. Nehemiah said, go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks and send some to those who have nothing prepared. This day is holy to our Lord. Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your... 
Now you know where we got happy Sabbath from. The joy of the Lord is your strength. This day is holy. It is special. Do not grieve. Do not be sad. It is a happy day. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Do not grieve. The Levites calmed all the people saying, be still for, the, for this is a holy day. Simply means a special day. It's a special day. Do not grieve. Then all the people went away to eat and drink, to send portions of food and to celebrate with great joy because they now understood the words that had been made known to them. That was also a commandment, to go and eat the choice food and, be- and drink the best beverages. This was potluck. Here all along, we thought we came up with these traditions. This is biblical. People would gather together. They would celebrate. They would shout. They would raise their hands. They would say amen. They would fall prostrate. They would cry. They'd be encouraged. Do not cry. Be, be the, Lord, the, 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 the joy of the Lord is your strength. Now go home and grub. Let me tell you something that's special about the Sabbath. The Sabbath is the first holiday. The first holy day The first holy day was the seventh-day Sabbath. Every major holiday, and that's just two words put together, holy day, holiday, put together, every major holiday is kept the same way the original Sabbath was kept in the Garden of Eden. There's three components to every major holiday. Rest, meaning you don't have to go to work, you don't have to go to school. What's the second one? Food, that's right. We know where your heart is. Food. We see it right here, food, the best food. Sabbath meals should be the best. I looked forward to Sabbath meals because I knew we were going to get down. What's the third one? Fellowship. Fellowship, a day of holy convocation. They all came together as a community. Every major holiday has this. If you take one of those components away, it's no longer as special. This is why God creates this experience for us. Worship is to be something that can be experienced, yes, alone, personal devotion. But on this day, it's beautiful because we all get to come together. And you see how the energy is. Go to a game where there's only 10 fans in a stadium that can hold 60,000, and I guarantee you, your experience will not be the same. You could be watching the exact same product on the field, but your experience will not be the same because there's not the mass. There's no numbers there. You're like, where are all the fans? Did I come to the wrong place? I have gone to games. I told you already. I think I told you already. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a Raiders fan, but see, back in the day when they were the L.A. Raiders, that's how I became connected to them. Uh, um, go silver and black. Anyways, so I have gone to the Coliseum when there were 92,000 fans cheering for the Raiders. Let me tell you, I was a kid, I was a teenager, and it blew me away. I had a hard time watching it on television from that point on. I know there are people watching right now, hello, online audience, I know some of you are sick and shut in, some of you are scared to come to church, some of it's COVID related, some of it is, you've got issues with people in the church, but it's not the same. You can worship online, you can sing the same songs, you can hear a good message, but it's not the same and does not replace being in the house. There's something about the synergy of God's people all coming together. There's something about hearing somebody say amen, and you look at them, you said amen too. I said amen, I know. That was a good point. That was a really good point. Amen. I love you. I love you too. There's something about it. I would hug men at Raider games who were just doused in alcohol and cigarettes, and, and I knew nothing about them, but I knew we were on the same team. And when the Raiders made that winning field goal in overtime, I embraced this man. Just held on to him. Felt his heart beat. I love you, man. I love you, too. Never saw him again. But worship brings us together. And that's what's happening in this text. It's not just 30,000 people. The entire city comes out. It says there in in chapter 6 that David starts handing out food for everybody. So everyone went home with some bread. This became a celebration, and that's what it should be. Worship has unfortunately been very contentious for us because we want to fight over different things like instruments. You don't want to know what David says. In Psalms 150, he says, come with the loud sounding cymbals, the timbrels, right, the harps, all of this stuff. And let's praise the Lord. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. And people always tell me, pastor, that's different. <laughs> One member told me, that not here, another church, told me that's different. That's not in the sanctuary. David dancing was not in the sanctuary. David praising was not in the sanctuary. I said, it was worse. It was before the Ark of the Covenant. 
He was literally in the most holy place. You couldn't get any holier than that. He even says it, it was before the Lord that I was undignified. Listen, I love the organ. This is the most holy instrument that we have. No, 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 no joke, no joke. No, really, it's the most holy instrument. You will not hear this instrument in the clubs. It is really holy. It's set apart. It is special. You all, listen, organs are ubiquitous with churches now. They're connected. You think organ, you think church. Most of these cathedrals have these organs, and look at these pipes. Oh, isn't it beautiful? It's a beautiful instrument. And some of you, you I, some, some of y'all worship this thing. You love the music. But do you know that the organ, its beginnings weren't very spiritual? When they were first created in Greece, the fourth century BC, wasn't spiritual. When Rome adopted it, Rome was using the organ for its arena games. Do you know what happened at arena games? Do you know what happened to God's people at arena games while the organ was being played? Dun, 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 dun. And the crowd was cheering. It does not have spiritual beginnings. It was played in bathhouses and brothels. It was not seen as a holy instrument until around the 10th century in Western Europe. Now it's holy. Now it's special. This is why I cannot get into these discussions with people and they start talking about, jewel the drums, pastor, have you been to a... My first introduction to drums was at a church, not a club. I have no association with drums in a club. I have association with drums in a church. That was the first time I heard live drums in a church. I'm sorry that some of y'all were clubbing out back in the day. But that's not my experience. So because you got baggage and issues, don't try to put that on me. I say the organ's the holiest instrument we have because you won't find it just anywhere. So it is holy. It's a special, it, it, it's pull out all the stops. You know that phrase, pull out all the stops? That's the, oh, don't tell, hey, son, I did this. That's what this is. Pulling out all the stops. Letting everything just blare. And many people don't mind hearing noise from this instrument, but they would have issues with noise from the drum set. And it's a digital set. So we can control the volume in the house of the Lord. Ain't nobody trying to control the volume over here. But it's okay. It's your personal preference. And it's okay to have personal preferences. When you feel something odd in your stomach, it doesn't mean the Holy Spirit is speaking to you. It just means you're uncomfortable. And it's okay to be uncomfortable. But your personal preferences cannot turn into personal attacks. Hello? Your personal preferences cannot turn into personal attacks. There are people that are ministered to by different music than you. What you have to be able to do, family, is when you see something that's not going on in the church the way that you prefer, the music that you like, the style that you like, I want you to pause for a moment and look at other people that are worshiping. Because there's certain songs I don't like. Can I be honest with you right now? Moment of vulnerability, I told Matt, Matt Daly, Dr. Matt, who has a doctorate in organ performance, but is our praise team leader. Come on, somebody got to say amen on that. That is just a beautiful balance. I love it. Has his doctorate here, but is our praise team leader. I told him, man, I've never been a, I've never been a fan of the song you're going to sing this morning. Every praise, that's what I told him. I said, I'm not, I don't, there might be some people that make it think it's too repetitive. He says, man, listen, there are people in this church that really like that song. I said, I'm good then. I didn't, I wasn't a big fan of it. I've heard that song in several churches. Every time I hear it, I'm like, Ugh. another repeat? Where's the theology of this song? Sounds like one of the Psalms just going over and on repeat. I was like, that's what I told him. But then he said, there are people who have come up to me and said, I love that song. I said, I'm sold. So what I was doing during, you know, every praise, I'm looking at other people. And I said, woo, they love this song. They were worshiping. 
So I celebrated their worship. Look at them ascribing worth to God. All right. Look, they love it. Lord, I, because worship brings us together. There are people in this church. We're going to wrap up right now. There are people in this church that would have never met each other if it weren't for corporate worship. You would have never seen, laid eyes. You wouldn't because of ethnic backgrounds, cultural backgrounds, uh, socioeconomic differences. You would have never met each other because you like classical, they like gospel. You would have never met each other. But worship is the great equalizer. It brings us together. And so this church is intentional, intentional, intentional about having a blended experience. So that we don't have people off on this side and that side. I want our young people to grow up hearing the organ so that it doesn't become some obsolete instrument. As long as I am here, it will be front and center. Although it does look kind of weird online because it's always kind of like coming out of, depending on It's another story. We'll, fig we'll figure that one out. The point is, is that it's special and it's holy. And we want that to still be celebrated as people are ministered to by it. And let me tell you something, if you don't like that song, if you don't like that style, you may have to endure it for 10 minutes. And then it's on to the stuff you like. Worship brings us together. I'm going to close on these things. Dr. Ellen White, she writes on worship. I want to use what she has to say about it only because she's a respected voice in this church. And I want you to know that even in her day, she was dealing with this kind of stuff you know, pertaining to worship. I know some people talk about the vision she saw in Indiana at the camp meeting and <clears throat> the instruments that she laid out. And, and everybody goes, oh, see, we can't have these instruments in the church. No, she's talking about a particular style. And some of you have been to churches like that. And let me tell you something, it's not like what we experience here. But listen to this. If we can put that on, on the screen, I hope you, you have it. Uh, the first quote, it says, another matter which should receive attention, she says, both at our camp meetings and elsewhere is, is that of singing. A minister should not give out hymns to be sung until it has first been ascertained that they are familiar to those who sing. What? Go on, Auntie Ellen. A proper person should be appointed to take charge of this exercise, and it should be his duty to see that such hymns are selected as can be sung with the spirit and with the understanding also. Singing is a part of the worship of God, but in the bungling manner in which it is often conducted, it is no credit to the truth and no honor to God. There should be a system and order in this as well. As every other part of the Lord's work, organize a company of the best singers whose voices can lead the congregation, and then let all who will unite with them. Those who sing should make an effort to sing in harmony. They should devote some time to practice that they may employ this talent to the glory of God. I'm sorry, she talking about a praise team. She talking about a praise team back in 1883. She says, in our camp meeting service, there should be singing and instrumental music. This is the next quote. Musical instruments were used in religious services in ancient times. And know this, the musicians were paid in the Old Testament to only play music. <laughs> That's another story for another day. That's why I don't have a problem when this church invests in its music. It's more biblical than you believe. Pay, putting a priority in your music to have the best is what they did in the Old Testament. There are professional people that have dedicated their life to use God's gift. And if we employ them to be a part of our church, don't complain. It's good music. And you pay for what you get. And we got good music here. She continues on. She says, the worshipers praise God upon the harp and the cymbal. But just in case you were curious what instruments she was including, the cymbal's there. She's, she's quoting David, which means the timbrel's there. So percussion is okay. And music should have its place in our services. It will add to the interest, she says. Look at, look at Dr. White saying it will add to the interest, using music to add to the interest of the worship experience. I'll leave this, this last one. She said, the meetings held, let a number be chosen to take part in the song service. 
and let the singing be accompanied with musical instruments skillfully handled. We are not to oppose the use of instruments of music in our work. The part of the service is to be carefully conducted, for it is the praise of God in song. The singing is not always to be done by a few. As often as possible, let the entire congregation join. She was basically saying it's not a concert. Family worship brings us together. It should not tear us apart. It should bring us together. <clears throat> In this house, it should bring us together. Even if it's not your preference, even if it's not your preference, even if it's not your preference, look to your brother and sister and see what they prefer. And like any good marriage, you say, you get this one. This is your song. But the next one's mine. Okay, as long as we, get, we, we work, we all be working together. Compromise. My last text. It's a good text. My last text. It's Zephaniah. Zephaniah chapter 3. Zephaniah chapter 3. I love this passage. God is talking to his children. And he's, they're coming out of captivity. And he's reestablishing them. On verse, <clears throat> verse 14, starting with verse 14. Oh, I love the word of God. Can we, we're going to close on this. Sing, daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all your heart. Rejoice with all your heart, daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away your Uzzah. Come home. I've taken away your punishment. I know you didn't handle things that were holy in the right way, but I bring you back. He has turned back your enemy. The Lord, the King of Israel, is with you. Never again will you fear any harm. On that day, they will say to Jerusalem, do not fear, Zion. Do not let your hands hang limp. Oh, come on, Adventists. You're going to be able to tell Adventists from any other believer. Because when Christ comes again and we are caught up to meet him in the air, our hands are going to be right next to our side. We, we are not moving. We will not be moved. He says, don't let your hands hang limp. The Lord your God is with you. The mighty warrior who saves, he will take great delight in you. In his love, he will no longer rebuke you, Uzzah. In his love, he will no longer rebuke you, Vallejo Drive. In his love, he will no longer rebuke you, Jonathan, but will rejoice over you with singing. Father God, thank you for singing over us with joy. Father God, thank you for reminding us that worship, although we make it very clear that you are our focus. You're the center of what we do. You are in our music. You have reminded us today that worship is really about us. You desire to bring us together. You desire in your holy uh, precepts to create and carve out a space for us to come together, for us to see one another, for us to be encouraged by your word, for us to be sung over with your rejoicing. Yes, 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 we worship you. We ascribe worth to you, but you also ascribe worth to us in this moment. So Father, forgive us for coming into this experience with just our own personal feelings and our own prejudice and, and, and our stubbornness. Lord, open our hearts. Give us a heart of true worship so that we can forgive and bring people together. People from different walks, people different preferences, different cultures. Because, Father, this is the point of worship. All your babies coming together, all your children coming together. Love on us in this moment. For you are a good, good father. Thank you. In Jesus' name.